I, I remember when the earthquake hit in 94, uh, and I was a city council member, and, and going to the grocery store on San Fernando Road in Polk, and, and, and uh, paying $20 for a gallon of water. $20. And I was a council member. Uh, and it wasn't illegal at the time. It's illegal now, but it wasn't illegal at the time. And uh, I don't shop there anymore. I don't shop there anymore. And, and all I'm saying is that cities uh, need to do the same thing. We need to, let's, let's simplify this. It's, you know, they talk about caveat emptor. Well, a consumer uh, in the young bank community, uh, they can't play on an on, on equal uh, playing field when it comes to caveat emptor. So they want to throw caveat emptor. It's your fault that you got yourself into that, that uh, uh, upside down loan, uh, and that was a dumb thing to do. Um, but let me tell you something. The cities, I believe, have an absolute responsibility to use copy inventory in their purchases. And the city of Los Angeles, where we have $6 billion in, in fluid cash every year and $30 billion when you look at our pension portfolios in terms of investment, uh, we have a responsibility to make sure that the banks and, and financial institutions that we are investing in, and even the projects that we're investing in, are returning the benefit as much as possible to the communities that we serve so that we don't end up serving those people on the streets of Los Angeles as, as homelessness uh, grows. And so, um, now some banks are doing a great job, and, and, and I, you know, I tell them, well then, you should love this, because we're gonna give you a good grade. Uh, but they don't want you to know uh, the details of their financial transaction. And most of that information is fully available, uh, the federal government has it, it's public documents, and uh, it is not creating new bureaucracy, it is simply being uh, more uh, aware of the purchases that, that we have the responsibility to make on behalf of our taxpayers. And so, uh, no, the, the two are absolutely consistent. And if the federal government is slow to act, then we have to act on the local level. Thank you, Richard. Let, let me uh, move on to another question, but Janice, you had a quick point you wanted to just add? Well, I just, I, I didn't want to let the about the uh, banks financing the, um, the, the payday lenders or the whoever's out there. I mean, first of all, we don't think that should be allowed, and, and actually grassroots advocacy is doing a pretty good job of weeding some of that out. But um, under some of the ideas that we've submitted to the Federal Reserve, any um, a bank would be graded on the performance of their investment at the home institution. So that, um, in my view, if you're going to put your money into a check capture, let's just say, if you get all the baggage that comes with it, and that should affect your CRA performance. Um, on the other hand, if you put your money in a community-based credit union that's doing a great job of uh, developing women's products or, or a starter credit, that those benefits pull up as well. Let me, uh, Neil, did you want to ask a question? And then I'm going to ask Olivia to interject on issues of uh, safeguarding individuals from predatory lending. Yes, I'd like to get this panel to respond to something that happened in the morning panel. We heard that one reason, one set of reasons why people are unbanked or underbanked is that they don't trust institutions. We also heard that some of the unbanked or crossover or underbanked, they've chosen to not use banks for whatever location they're technically doing. It. So what happens in 2013, and all social security buddies are electronic, what, happened, what would happen if unemployment benefits extended as they will be in the next couple of days? What if they were electronically Never. How do we move the needle so that we get to those places, to get that a, a place in society, financially, economically, so people can have banking, so they can receive these electronic payments? What's the next few small steps? Who wants to text? Well, did they want to try that first? Yeah. Go fight over. It's okay. <laughs> Well, you know, it, um, it's fascinating to, to hear Daniel share about how um, folks that are crossovers, uh, that it's not so much an issue of education as much as an issue of, of, of assimilation, I would argue, integration. Um, but I think that comes right back to education all over again, um, that it is an issue of trust. And we've heard this time and time again, particularly when it comes to these vulnerable communities, families that are, um, that are welfare families, for example. And I think that uh, there are models out there that are proven, that are working, that are successful, and I'm excited about the next panel. Uh, colleague Lee Phillips, who's in the room. Um, the city of San Francisco is a fabulous model 
Bank on San Francisco that became Bank on California, that's now Bank on USA. Um, they've, you know, there's what, 52,000 52, San Francisco that have opened starter accounts. But it was a collaboration between the city that rubber stamped it, right? The politicians have to be held accountable and they're going to have to be reelected. And so they better ensure that these programs do, in fact, work and that folks. Are, um, are not being gouged in any way, um, but it's also with a partnership with credit unions and banks and community-based organizations um, that did, have developed um, a whole array of other services, um, whether it be IDAs or children's savings accounts or offer financial education and services. And so these collaborative models are out there and they're working and I think that we just take the lessons of San Francisco and figure out how we replicate um, these models. Um, Bank On, for example, is now being, um, it's being replicated in over 70 cities, over five states, uh, and the Treasury now under the Obama administration is trying to figure out how they now launch Bank on USA and have put a $50 million to figure out how they take those lessons um, and, and those models again that we know work. Um, I'd be fascinating to, to see uh, what happens here in Los Angeles with Bank on LA that launched in the spring of 08. Um, but again, I think those models are out there, they are working, and there just needs to be more collaboration, um, particularly with community-based organizations that have been serving the needs of the community, that know who the community are, and we think we should be reaching out to them um, so that it's, it, again, so that it's a collaborative way that we're addressing this. Ernie? If it's too early to do it, then we need to organize and tell them to play it. Because it's their, it's their I mean, it, it's our social security, it's not, it belongs to the people that earned it. So my view is that we ought to do everything we can to get folks better banking services, get them banked, if you will, that's the term. But if it isn't time to do it, that's the power of what ARP brings, and that's the power of our membership, to advocate with Congress and our president to say it's not time. I mean, regulations don't work if they hurt the very people it's supposed to help. Yeah. I, 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 Oh, I'm sorry, Richard, I to ask because um, I'm not sure the issue is trust. Um, in fact, if you look at the Pew study, it, it, it says the primary reason people choose where they bank or what, or what financial institution, uh, you know, the vast majority of people is, is location. The unbanked will use payday lenders or whatever institution. 84% said they chose them because uh, it's it's close to where they live. You know, for my residents of Coima, do I want them to uh, ride their bike to Panorama City carrying cash to deposit it or take the bus? It's a very pragmatic decision. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do my transaction within a few blocks of my house. It's safer. On the issue of trust, however, uh, the federal government needs to do a lot more to, to give back the trust by regulating. And we have created a society that, that uh, is driven by, by a corporate uh, thinking that has eliminated the, the, the notion of, of uh, uh, scrutinizing uh, financial institutions. You just trust them uh, because you're supposed to. You know, business is good, but anything else is bad. And, and I don't think that was, I mean, the original founders of, of capitalism even said that it must be controlled, it must be regulated because there's a fundamental human nature uh, that is driven by greed. And, and, and corporations are, I think, the epitome of that. So we have a singular opportunity, I believe. At this time when we have seen the tremendous devastation of our economy by uh, uh, irreputable uh, banking and financial uh, transactions, uh, that now is the time to, to incorporate the kind of scrutiny and regulations that will bring the full light of day on these institutions, and thereby truly uh, not not so much building trust, but ensuring that the the uh, customers are going to get fair treatment, um, and then the, the customers themselves have to understand what the transaction is, and they have to get the benefit. When I when I go for a transaction, and most of you, when you go for a transaction, you're not thinking, well, do I, do I trust this bank? You're thinking, how do I maximize what I get out of this transaction? So we have to make them more knowledgeable because right now they are not knowledgeable about how to get a fair, fair loan. I, I, I tried to get a bill passed in Sacramento, and, and, and you guys supported it. You remember it? It was the, it was, it was uh, requiring that, that insurance companies, car dealerships, uh, banking institutions provide contracts, 
in five languages if they advertise in those languages. In other words, if you can advertise in that language and you want those people business, then you better uh, write at, at least an outline of the contract in that language if they request it. Well, it was killed, but the, what, what really angered me about it was that the chairman of the committee that, that killed the bill uh, was a, um, uh, what do you call it, a translator child. He translated for his parents their transactions. And the reason he killed it was because he wanted to do the bill the next year, and, and the next year Arnold Schwarzenegger was in, and nobody could translate what he was doing. So, <laughs> maybe, uh, sometimes it's our, own, it's our own people that we have to watch out for. Janice, and then I'm going to ask Louise Koch, I'm going to have her ask a question. Janice? I just want to pick up on the, um, and the distrust theme, and we're sort of beating it to death, but just a couple more thoughts here. I mean, I think in, in this room, as folks that have come together as advocates, are aware of the layers of, that we are communicating, the dynamic of distrust. But I think we need to be really careful, and I would challenge us actually to break away from this as a framework that we use to describe the unbanked and the underbanked. Because the problem is, is that it really puts all the onus um, on that family, on that individual family. There's something wrong with you. You inherently mistrust financial institutions. When the problem really is that we need to get financial institutions to be more credible and accountable to the low income um, and unbanked or underbanked segment. And that that is not happening right now. As I said before, it's not like you have tons and tons of financial institutions clamoring to, um, you know, to upsell one another, providing the best product possible to this customer segment. That's not happening. And another part of the problem is that um, as was alluded in the earlier panel, this is a high-touch crowd. It takes more work to get here. Again, I think we need to think about strategies that allow financial institutions to collaborate and that really pushes them to, be, um, to make themselves available and credible before this audience. That needs to be our framework, not whether or not the, the borrower is, is somehow like hiding in the shadows uh, and, uh, and avoiding financial institutions. Olivia? I'm excited about this banking development district model, and uh, and and again pleased that uh, Alar Cohen has taken leadership here in the city of LA because we know that this model has worked in in New York City. Right since 2002, um, they were trying to figure out how they can create incentives, the carrots to get financial institutions in communities, low-income communities that lacked uh, that lacked banks, that lacked credit unions, uh, because folks uh, that wanted to be there, banks that wanted to be there, said, look. We'd love to be able to open up shop, but we're not going to be viable financially in the short term, right? Because there's not enough deposits in this community. It's, it's low income, and so how do we figure out the carrots necessary uh, to uh, to bring these banks to these communities? And so the model works, uh, and I'm thrilled that it's happening in the city of LA, and, and looking forward to, have, to have, having it happen statewide. But again, I think what's really exciting about the banking development district model in California and in LA is that learning from the experience of New York, that we're not talking about just a proximity issue. Proximity is important, and we're going to get those banks in these communities, but the products and services are important. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about predatory payday lending. I see a colleague of mine, Jamal Ahmed, from the Center for Responsible Lending in the audience, and they've been leaders statewide and nationally in trying to curb predatory payday lending. Um, in the in, in AERP study, we, we learned that in the 45 plus age group, that folks are repeat borrowers. They need credit, right? Because their checks are not cutting uh, if for, their, for their daily needs and their bills. And we know that in California, over 1 million Californians take out an average of 10 payday loans a year. And it's disproportionately located in our communities of color, stripping $245 million of wealth. And those are exorbitant fees that could otherwise be saved. And so we can't very well talk about asset building and wealth building if we don't deal with the issue of predatory lending and stripping the wealth from our communities. Um, so that's my final thought. I appreciate that. Louise? <laughs> yes. You know, I, the thing that's so underlying as I listen to this is the issue of education, whether it's what the councilman is saying or whether Ms. Calderon is saying. And I want to ask Ms. Calderon, is Los Angeles, to the best, are we doing anything at all to emulate that uh, San Francisco uh, model? Is any movement at all taking place in the element, you know, elementary schools in our curriculum here? Not that I'm aware of, but I'd love that for Councilman Alarcon to take the lead in creating that in the city of LA. <laughs> <laughs> is there, is there a Richard, we're giving you new responsibility. <laughs> um, if there's one thing I regret, uh, 
not doing as a state senator was requiring financial literacy incorporated into our math program in the high schools. It's all an issue of how many minutes are dedicated to various subjects and the, and the various uh, players get very upset when you step on their toes. But, but I think there, there should be a way, and I, and I, I actually want to introduce a, a resolution to this effect, to call on the state legislature to require a, um, a, a segment of, of time be dedicated for financial literacy uh, and incorporated into the math program so that it doesn't take anybody's minutes away. And so when, when would this happen? <laughs> I mean, as soon as, it just as, soon as your legislature acts. Um, you know, it, it, first of all, um, it, it is going on. Anecdotally, there are teachers, particularly math teachers, who are using uh, this type of, of uh, tool in their in their last lesson plan. Uh, it's it's just it's just good teaching. It's the easiest mm -hmm. thing to do. It's what I was doing at Chicago Service Action Center 30 years ago. Um, and uh, so I think the, the, that that to, but to get the California legislature to act on it uh, again, uh, I, I I can't explain to you in, in, in short comments how difficult it is to get that kind of legislation passed. Uh, but changing uh, the, the educational code relative to uh, curriculum is one of the hardest things to do in, in the California legislature. But nevertheless, we, sh we should start that movement, and I, I would think that our banking institutions should support it, uh, and, uh, and that might help. We, we have, I think, just two minutes left, so we'll take one last question. Who needs to have this question? Otherwise, they they will be ruined. <laughs> I think the lady in the back is waving her hand. Sorry, sir. Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Good morning, Tamila Grash, representing Green Line Institute today. Oh. Actually, as a facilitator, you asked this question, but it wasn't answered. I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to get it answered. Uh, we represent low-income and majority Californians here uh, in the state on a variety of public policy issues, including banking. And AARP being here today is wonderful because I think as we think about the seniors and we're really focused on that particular underbank population, how do we ensure together that we reach as many people of color in the state to continue to be part of potentially the AARP platform um, as well as being leaders in this particular area because I think that there's specific emphasis in ensuring that people of color are part of that process going forward. Right, I'm going to turn it over to Ernie now that I've set you up. Just, you know, respond to that question, and we, and we will wind up. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Medicare was going to cut doctor reimbursements by 30%. It was scheduled for January 1st. On Friday, that was stopped. And doctors will not face these drastic cuts, which would have been fewer primary care providers for Medicare recipients. It was stopped through 100,000 phone calls generated by the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. My point being that the opportunity for all of these communities, African American and Latino communities, what ARP brings is not just the products and not just the consumer stuff, which is important and valuable, but a sense of, a, a, a sense of being in a large organization that is changing so that it can work at a more local level to make politicians and political leaders and policymakers more accountable. I use the Dr. Fix example as a case in point of the kind of mobilization that we can do and have done. And, and in these times of near depression or, or certainly a terrible recession, that kind of unity is called for. And I think it has enormous potential by Los Angeles, not only because I love Los Angeles because it's my home, but also because I see the people gathered here and I see the potential and the will, the institutional will for ARP to put real strong resources through the kinds of studies we're presenting today, through the kinds of collaboration that we're doing. So it's an enormous opportunity and it is a change, it is, it's, it's a changing moment. So, so my, the reason why someone should, should be part of ARP because um, is because it is an organization that has. And ten years ago, we didn't know how to we didn't know how to go local. We did not know how to go local. <laughs> we are learning quickly because.
because that's out of necessity, that's out of being a good steward of our members' principles. So my view is that um, it is that you will see in all of our major media, whether it's the magazine or the bulletin, or our e-distribution, uh, ways that are, that are much more relevant to the day-to-day -day lives of low-income ARP members in ways we've not been before. Um, uh, and I'm excited about that opportunity. Thank you, Bernie. Our, our time uh, is up, and uh, I, I, I wondered at first if we would be able to fill up the time. It's clear that we don't have enough time and I think that's a testimony to both the extraordinary expertise that uh, Richard, Bernie, Janice, Olivia bring to the table, but also your passion, your leadership on these issues, and uh, that we have uh, just an extraordinary coalition of stakeholders in this room uh, that uh, hopefully will be a new partnership to move these issues further, put it on the local, state, and national agenda, uh, there are many more questions uh, I'm sure that you all want to ask. Our guests will be here uh, so you can uh, touch base with them as we wind down. But again, for the four of you, thank you for all that you're doing and for giving us your time. You guys have a, you should have your, the, the list of files um, in your packet. Um, first here um, on my right, we have Kimi Anderson, who's the Vice President of Broadway Federal Bank. Uh, in the community development uh, group there. Uh, Broadway Federal is one of the African-American home base in LA. Um, they did a lot of work in the community, have five branches, and I have the pleasure of working with TV on the bank on LA campaign on other things. And I was always so, um, and I don't want to shake his head over there, because uh, one of our nonprofit partners, because they do so much work there, they're always so willing to be flexible uh, in thinking about the product delivery and how they could uh, serve uh, Low income folks. Uh, uh, next, we have Jesse. And Jesse is the president and CEO of Pan American Bank. Uh, I'm so happy with Jesse here today because um, he's just doing a lot of things out there in East LA and really pushing uh, to, to bank Latinos and educate them about the benefits of financial services um, at his bank or at other banks. Um, and what I've liked, I'm mostly, I don't think I've told you this yet, but I follow him on Twitter and on Facebook. And Pan American Bank is just really active on, uh, on, those, on those media outlets, which is really important, really sort of pushing the limit. Uh, I visited him one time at Pan American Bank. And his bank has really opened up to the nonprofit there. You know, so it's, he's doing a lot of good work. Uh, Steve uh, Street, uh, right next to him, I had the pleasure of meeting him today and we talked on the phone a couple times uh, before today. Uh, but I'm really just fascinated and you feel really excited to meet him because he uh, is the CEO of Green Dot Corporation. Uh, that develops prepaid cards. Um, and as, as we talked about in the other panels, the, the prepaid card is really seen as the newest innovation in banking. Uh, folks that might not be ready to have you know, a normal bank account, uh, the prepaid card, uh, a lot of experts think is sort of the, you know, a little step to get there. Um, and Steve is doing a ton of innovative work at Green Dot to, to really push that forward. And then lastly, um, on the end is Lee Phillips uh, from San Francisco. Um, we're really excited to have her. Uh, she's, done, she's done so much work, she's going to talk a lot about that, but uh, I had the pleasure of working with her on the day on stuff as well. Um, and she, anybody that knows what's going on in sort of the asset elite arena knows we built because of the innovative work that the city of San Francisco is doing. Not only with the campaign to promote uh, uh, banking, uh, but also sort of on other products that hopefully she'll, she'll teach us about. Um, and so with that, uh, the way the format's going to go today is I'm going to go ahead and um, just ask them for a general question, and then I'm just going to do some investigative reporting with them to ask them more about what, uh, what they're doing, uh, sort of how they feel that the market could, uh, the banks could sort of to play a role in this. And I know in the other times we were talking about you know, reform and all that kind of stuff, but I think it's important to mention that financial institutions are a really important, our primary partner in this work. Uh, not only the not only the community bank, but also the big guys, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase. We, they're all they all are good partners, and we could really incorporate them into some of these. So with that, I mean, you know, the first question I have to, to all you, and I guess I could start with Stevie, is uh, what is Broadway Federal doing to, to serve the the underpaid? Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so. 
broadly defined. So one of the things I guess I'll just sort of preface with, and um, Rudy mentioned this in my intro, you know, Broadway's been around for 64 years, we're the oldest, the largest uh, minority founded thing. Um, we got started basically with a mission to serve, at that time, uh, we classified as under banks, people who were denied credit, who couldn't get access to capital. Uh, African American families were coming back from the war and money, and they couldn't get a loan for the mission. Um, so, basically, the, the serving the underserved, the underbanked, has been embedded in our mission from, from the beginning. I think the uh, issue, challenge, opportunity we've faced in more recent years is that this definition for us has shifted. The, uh, the underbanked is not really denied access um, anymore. And so how do we think about sort of servicing the newer needs um, of this sort of population that may be choosing to not bank in mainstream uh, financial institutions. Um, and so we started to come up with ideas uh, around this, um, this this question, really with the overall goal of figuring out how can we build wealth in our communities, how can we keep wealth in our communities. So our, our attempts to, to, to answer this question have been de definitely more on the um, focus on encouraging savings and also uh, from the perspective of providing education to our community. So we haven't I'll be honest, had the greatest success with more of the transactional-based products, and we're trying to figure out how we can better um, do better in that area. Uh, but we, we do have a strong area of expertise in the first two products, the first two sort of practice areas. So on the product side, we have been pretty successful with uh, products like second chance um, accounts. So you know, sort of the checklist checking, you know, this checking and saving uh, saving side. And really just targeting those customers that may have had issues with check systems in the past and just giving them another opportunity to try banking again. Um, we've also been a part of um, providing the government's program to encourage uh, people to open more ETA accounts. So people who are receiving uh, payments from the uh, government, Social Security, Medicaid, to actually encourage them to do direct deposit and um, have been uh, active in that particular movement. And, we have a variety of savings products. Um, I was really, I think, excited to hear Olivia talk about her her belief, and, and we believe this as well, that we really have to start teaching savings at a young age. And so a lot of our products range from youth saver accounts, so someone who's young as four years old can open an account in their own name, very small opening balances, and we have a lot of education that goes along with that to make it fun, to make it interesting, um, all the way up to, for example, an 18-month small saver account which is um, pretty exciting because it's something that allows people who may not be used to saving to open up a savings. Well, it's a CD product, so it offers a CD rate, but they can actually um, add money over time, as opposed to just being able to start with one particular balance. Um, let's see. I think that, as I mentioned, I mean, a lot of our products are geared towards asset building, wealth creation, and um, we've realized that the only way to encourage people to put money into banks, especially if they have not been, I think, acculturated from a young age to, to, to really prioritize savings, or if, for example, they're operating with such small margins they can't always think about savings. As I said, the, the other side of the point is really the educational component, and how can we um, really be sort of that bastion, that open space for people to be able to come um, and receive education and to be encouraged. And one of the ways we really, really realized that as a bank we need to do this is through collaboration. So um, with organizations like CFRC um, and other community-based organizations, activities like Bank in LA, uh, that's really been a, uh, a strong area of focus for us because we're just, we're just realizing we can't do it on our own. Right now, the regulatory environment for community banks is extremely tough. And as much as we would like, I think, to take um, advantage of more innovative products, uh, things like you know, prepaid debit cards and stuff, it's really hard because those um, products are seen as more risky. So we are always sort of balanced, or challenged in trying to find the balance with doing um, and taking steps that will have more social and potentially economic rewards for our community, but at the same time, you know, making sure that we're still keeping in context our, our, our fiduciary responsibility to maintain our financial soundness and to, quite frankly, make sure our neighborhoods are happy and let us keep our doors open. So I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of banks right now are facing 
Um, and so I'm excited to be here to see and listen to and receive um, all the great information and ideas that are out there and how we can better play a role in this, uh, you know, solving this problem moving forward. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Bree and, uh, and ARP, thank you very much for having us uh, join you all today. Um, back in December of 2009, the FDAC and the Census put out a study um, related to the unbanked and the underbanked. And their conclusions were that in certain Latino communities, um, the numbers were as high as 40%. But uh, honestly, given what we see in our communities, uh, it's probably much higher. Uh, Pan American Bank is. Uh, it's a bank that was founded back in 1964, so it's probably the second oldest minority-owned bank. Um, we uh, we were set up with, similar to Broadway uh, with the express purpose of serving uh, the underserved Latino markets. Um, we set up shop in East Los Angeles. We opened up two branches there. We opened up another branch in Santa Ana. So these are the two Orange County, the Orange County, LA County strongholds of Latinos. Um, but when we set up shop, we didn't set it up for the purpose of going after the high network folks. We set it up for the purpose of helping out these small business owners get the financing that they need to get their businesses off the ground, as well as the homeowners to buy their first home and enable other consumers to do what they need to do. Uh, our founder, uh, a woman by the name of Ramona Costa Meadows, uh, is a gal that was born in 1925, 1925 in Miami, Arizona. And at the age of eight, 33, she was supported with the family. Uh, very similar circumstances to what we're seeing now. And, uh, and when she returned to the States, um, she uh, became a small business owner. She worked, came up to Los Angeles and started working in laundry service, saved up her pennies, and eventually bought a tortilla machine. Uh, that tortilla making machine became the, became the beginning of what is today known as Ramona's Mexican Food Products. Uh, by, the 19, by the early 1960s, Ramona's had made millions of dollars, and, and Mrs. B, as we referred to her, uh, had become, uh, was a, a self-made woman. Uh, in the mid-60s, and, uh, and I'm, I'm proud to say that out in the audience, I'm not going to point fingers, but uh, is, is a current uh, Pan American Bank shareholder, and, and uh, this person's uh, uh, parents were involved in the formation of, of our organization. So back in the mid-60s, a number of small uh, investors came to Mrs. B and asked for help in terms of starting up uh, this, this bank, in which they did, they put this thing together. and. Uh, and based on the success of the bank, based on her success as an entrepreneur, she was uh, appointed the first Latina U.S. Treasurer that served under Nixon. About 10 years later, uh, Pan American Bank had its second uh, U.S. Treasurer appointee. Uh, so this little $40 million bank in the heart of East Los Angeles has actually produced two United States Treasurers, which is quite, quite a feat. It kind of speaks to uh, what can be done in these communities and that many times we ignore. Um, so our mission has been for the last 46 years to serve the need of the unbanked and underbanked, particularly the Spanish-speaking communities, uh, those that are immigrants, uh, those that are first uh, and, and some degree second, some degree second generation. Um, I'd like to say in any case that we actually are a social uh, organization or social enterprise, rather, um, because so many of our in our community uh, are in need of help um, in one form or another. Uh, We've been around for 46 years, and our board uh, last year uh, got together and said, what is it going to take for us to survive another 46 years? As uh, Evie had, had said a few moments ago, the regulatory environment has changed significantly. Uh, significantly. Um, uh, I like to say uh, the regulators are taking all the fun out of being a banker. And um, in, you know, in my nearly 20 years of banking, I have, I have never been in an environment where it is so anti-community banking. Um, and, and being a competitor, always being in, uh, being a competitor, be, being uh, being involved in team sports, and I always look upon these as challenges. I always say, you know, you're not going to beat us, you're not going to beat us, and, and certainly this is no exception. But it is really a, a tough environment, a tough time to be a community bank. Um, having said that, we haven't, we, we haven't left. We continue. I mean, we all of our all of our programs, for the most part, all of our new programs are intended to uh, create conversion. Um, with such a high number of unbanked and unbanked folks, we see uh, a lot of predatory practices out there. Um, and, and the unfortunate part about it is that it becomes an accepted practice. Our folks don't know any better, unfortunately. Uh, the other thing is, <clears throat> in our efforts to try to bring them in the door, um, they, are very, they are very suspicious as well. 
So uh, they've sort of become used to uh, some of the practices that, that, that they've become victims to, in my, in my opinion. And, uh, and to an extent, it's, well, it's, uh, it's brainwashed them also. Uh, because uh, when we come to them and we say, you know, we've got an alternative for you that is going to enable you to put more money in your pocket to save for the future to start building assets, uh, they, are, they are hesitant to do so. And there's a number of reasons why they do so. And I'm sure Mr. Street will actually talk to us, speak to a lot of those reasons because it's, it's right down in his alley. Um, so, so what are we doing? Well, uh, uh, earlier today, um, someone mentioned uh, the topic of financial literacy. Obviously, financial literacy is a key component. In fact, uh, we work very closely with LAUSD as well as a number of charter schools uh, in delivering financial literacy. Our goal, in fact, is to make sure that every child in the East Los Angeles and Santa Ana community have gone through a formal financial literacy training program. Um, in fact, um, just this week, we launched uh, what we call the Financial Literacy Ambassadors Program. And it's a program that we, we've launched through uh, KIPP, uh, the KIPP Charter School Program, KIPP LA. And so what we've done at, at the Raices Academy, which is our elementary school in Los Angeles, is we've created an academy. It's called the Financial, Financial Literacy Ambassador Academy. And two kids from each second grade class, which is their oldest class at this point, their oldest grade level, will be selected to become ambassadors. And they're going to go through a six-month intensive program at the conclusion of the six months, they will become the kids that then train the other kids in the school on financial literacy. So it's essentially a train to train program. When these kids complete the six-month program, we are going to actually put in to their uh, scholarship fund a, 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 a stipend that will continue to do this on an annual basis so long as they continue in the program. The idea is that this, um, we're a small bank. We're the very smallest bank in Los Angeles County. Uh, we serve a population just in East Los Angeles that's about 150,000 residents. There's no way we can serve every possible child, much you know, much less every 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 resident. But if we can leverage these kids, we can make them the uh, the tool to go out and further uh, evangelize on the importance of financial literacy. We can cover a lot more ground. And so this program, like I said, we just put we put it together uh, very quickly. Uh, Cape has been fantastic, and, and it launches uh, this week. We uh, we're going to announce the uh, the ten kids that have been selected. And then in Jan the first week, of, the first or second week of January, we begin the uh, the intensive after school training program. So these kids are going to go through about six months of training, and then uh, along, and then they get the not only do they get the, the, the uh, financial literacy, but they get leadership training, they get presentation training, they get the whole thing. So it actually is, is, is a program that we think is going to benefit them immensely. And uh, and this is sort of a, a pilot, which we suspect is going to be picked up by by a number of other schools, including LASD. So that's something that we do uh, along those same lines. Uh, uh, we have a program that our foundation funds, and that's every child in East Los Angeles that comes in to open an account uh, just has to show up with parents. Uh, as long as they sign the documentation, they get issued a free savings account. No monthly fee, no monthly dollars requirement. On top of that, what we do is we put the first $5 in the account for them. Uh, we then enroll them into our financial literacy program. So uh, every quarter they come in for a tour, they come in for some financial literacy training. At the same time, they come with the parents, we pull the parents aside, and and this last quarter, we've been working through LA, LA Up, uh, and they've been providing training to the uh, to the parents relative to not only financial literacy, but how to become a better parent as well. So we sort of capture both populations there at once. Uh, we give them tours of the bank. We uh, we bring in uh, authors. So some of you might be familiar with Sam Rennick and Sammy the Rabbit, as well as uh, Elena Redmond with uh, with the Power of the Pain program. And then um, we also have in our in our uh, tool chest of child financial literacy authors, we have Kelly Rogers, who is the author of uh, uh, something for Sav something for Savvy. So we bring the kids in on the weekends, and we have these authors read to them about the first financial literacy of their story. Um, we also, since August, we paired up with uh, Eddie Olmos and his Latino like, Literacy Now Foundation. And so every Saturday since about mid August, we've had a reading hour for kids. And Latino authors bring come into the bank uh, and read uh, stories to the kids, and uh, the first ten kids to show up get a free book. Uh, the, the concept behind that is simple: um, if if we as a bank, as a community bank, are going to survive the next four to six years, we need to make sure that the community is viable. We need to make sure that they're financially viable. We need to make sure that they're bankable assets for us in the sense of human assets, you can say. Uh, and the only way uh, that that's going to happen is if we step up. No one else is going to step up to do it. We need to step up to do it ourselves. And so what we've done is we, we've taken this almost a holistic approach to ensuring uh, that these folks are financially savvy. And so through this reading program at the Eddie Olmos Foundation, with the University Now, through our financial literacy program, uh, through these savings programs, uh, we, we sort of try to make the kids a whole uh, and, and so and, and ensure that they um, they do grow up 
becoming financial liter financially literate. Uh, we also just recently partnered with a hospital, a Monty Hospital, uh, Monty Health Systems. And uh, every child that's born in one of their three hospitals, either in Los Angeles, uh, um, Huntington Park, or Gardena, uh, uh, upon leaving the hospital with the parent, the mother has a baby in one hand, a blanket, a bag of diapers, and a $10 savings account, where the bank has part, uh, put in $5 and the hospital has put in $5. So the idea is from birth, uh, they will walk out with a tool that will enable them to then become asset builders. And again, they get added to our database, and along as they grow up, as they become older, uh, we have them as a captive audience and teach them the tools they need. Um, the project that we're working on now, and some of you might have read my email recently, which was an inquiry that went out to my to my email base, was uh, we're looking to uh, to give the bank to the kids in the community. Uh, we're, we're in the process of trying to develop a program where we raise money through our foundation, turn around and dollar for dollar, every dollar that's raised, we buy stock and we give it literally to the children in the community, so they become the shareholders in the bank. Uh, when we go out and we provide financial literacy training, we give them these savings accounts, we give them five dollars, uh, and we teach them about savings, we teach them about checking, but we also teach them about investments. Unfortunately, uh, that's a concept that in many, case, many cases they will never firsthand know, they will never experience. And so our idea is if we can give them five, ten shares in a bank in their community, they can have pride and ownership, they can become, in a sense, a future customer, but really it, it inspires them to learn more about these parts of investing, and, and, and hopefully, again, the next generation uh, becomes a, a generation of asset builders. Uh, and, and in 10, 12 years, when the Census Bureau and FGIC come back around our neck of the woods and say, how many of our folks are banked and underbanked did, instead of 40, 45%, it's more like 4%. So, uh, so that's something that's out there. And if anyone actually has any ideas or has heard of any, anyone doing anything like this, please let me know because I can say we're in the process of sort of uh, researching to figure out if that actually is a viable plan because there's something I'd like more than to empower our local kids in the community by making them owners in, in this bank. Because it will, that will definitely ensure the long-standing survival of the bank. Um, uh, what else do we do? Uh, well, we um, we have donated half of our space in our corporate office to nonprofits. We have what we call nonprofit row, and we put three of three of East LA's hardest working nonprofits in there. Uh, we, we 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 provide the space for them for one dollar, and uh, and uh, they have the run of the place. Um, we have a uh, Bella, which is volunteers of East LA. Uh, we have community union, which many of you are familiar with, and Larry Ortega's group. His house out of there as well, as well as another organization, a new media nonprofit, um, LatinoGraduate.net, which is in the business of helping kids graduate from high school, get to college, graduate from college, and then figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. And so all three of those nonprofits have provided space uh, for a buck uh, a year out of, out of our corporate facilities. Um, and, uh, and we work very closely with them. We, we, we partner with we help them with their fundraising. We make connections for them uh, along the same lines. Uh, they, they create connections for us and, and, and enable us to become more visible in the community. Um, as, as everyone up here knows, the only way we can reach the Sunbank community is by working with the trust agents. Um, we're a bank. Um, we've always been looked upon, as, in a sense, as the evil empire, while well, post-target, you imagine what, we, what, what, what they're saying about us. And so, uh, and even though we are community banks and we are very different and we didn't take TARP, uh, we're, we're all painted with that same brush, and so the only way we're going to be able to accomplish anything uh, is to work with nonprofits, to work with the schools, to work with the churches, to work with the hospitals, to work with those that have trust in the community that can then vouch for the activities that we do in the community. And so that's essentially what we've done, in, in a sense, and, uh, and that's what the goal is, uh, in a sense, by bringing in these nonprofits and giving them this space there as well. Uh, we try to be as innovative as possible. Uh, yet you have to think outside the box when it comes to working with these groups, whether it's the young, whether it's the old. Uh, you, you know, these are these are folks that don't fall in the middle of the bell curve. These guys, these guys are are in the long tail in a sense, and so you have to go ahead and find different ways of working with them. Someone said earlier that you have to uh, that this is a high touch uh, community, and it definitely is. Uh, our customers, in particular, 95 percent plus. Uh, do their business, financial business in Spanish. So we need to make sure that we have a staff that's 100% bilingual. Uh, I am bilingual, um, but I'm probably the worst of, of, of those on staff. I'm, I'm what, uh, I refer to myself as a pocho, so any of you who are, who are Latino here know exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm a you know, pocho. Um, but, um, uh, so it requires us to, to, you know, to make sure that we have 100% bilingual stuff. It, it requires that, uh, that we not rely on, on, on technology and tools. I mean, certainly we want to uh, get our folks onto technology and take advantage of those tools. But uh, what we, the reality is that uh, our very young, our very old, and, 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 and our newly uh, immigrated, 
may not know how to use some of the tools that we use for banking. And so we have to kind of coach them along. Um, one, of the, one of the great things is that community union, that nonprofit that we brought in, brought with it a 30C computer lab as, along with trainers. So, uh, so we're able to train uh, our community in Spanish on how to use how to use computers. In fact, we just launched last week uh, one million NIU, which is one million new internet users, which is a, a multi-faith effort uh, here in Los Angeles to increase the number of internet users by a million to ensure that these parents can can, uh, can use the internet in a manner that will allow them to watch over their kids a lot better. Um, and then, uh, what else do I have here? Um, and uh, well, I'll leave it at that. I'm sure you guys are. Uh, We'll have, we'll have some questions for me, but uh, uh, you know the bottom line is, is, is um, it seems our mission our mission is uh, to serve the the un, un, unbanked and underbanked um, everything that we do everything that we think we invest in um, uh, we look at that mission um, when when people come to me and say hey you know uh, can you give us a contribution for this or that or the other or will you partner with us for this that or the other the first thing we do is we bump it up against that mission that we have and we say is this consistent with what we are intended here to do and if it is great and we try to find a way to make it happen if it isn't we just say kindly you know. This isn't consistent, uh, and this comes down quite honestly to our investors, uh, investors that come in when we have them come, you know, very often uh, wanting to buy a big piece of the bank. We say, you know, what what are what are your intentions? Because your intentions are to take that charter off the wall, move it to the west side, and look for folks that uh, that have big deeper pockets. Then we're not interested, and uh, because we are the only bank headquartered in East Los Angeles, and our community and our people need us. And so, uh, so again, mission is most important. Uh, it's uh, it's obviously uh, extremely important for. Uh, it seems for any uh, minority-owned bank, and, uh, and so uh, with that, I will go ahead and pass it on to Mr. Street. <clears throat> what a great number of positions! I love community banks. <laughs> it's amazing, and, and people um, often say, "Well, you know, the ICBA will be representing the interests of community banks on Capitol Hill and so forth." And people always say, well, "Why community bank? This is why. That is really inspirational." Um, I don't think you see. Chases the world doing those kinds of things, certainly not directly in LA or uh, Broadway. That's, that's fabulous. Anyhow, uh, is Mrs. B still on? Yes. Is she alive? Yeah. That's wonderful. Hey, Jesse, yeah. Jesse, you can tell us who that investor is. I will not tell you. I got that fundraising from SEC rule, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love entrepreneurial stories like that. Steve, can you um, can you tell us not only how uh, your company serves uh, the underbank, or how, how would you say that, Jen, is the new term? Sure. Uh, underserved or the underserved crossovers. That's a good product. Crossovers are from unbanked to the bank. That's right. That's good. So, how do you serve that population? But then also, I don't know if you could add. Uh, can you also talk a little bit about how you complement uh, sort of the work of others? Yeah. By the way, um, uh, real quickly, true story. There was this big uh, conference with an award ceremony for banks doing the most for underserved Americans. This is in Las Vegas about three years ago. And the announcer that was hired, which none of us hired, was a staff announcer from the hotel, kept saying, undeserved. Oh. <laughs> and the winner for the undeserved <laughs> customer award, people were horrified. <laughs> So crossover may be better. That may be the new one. You can't just pronounce that one. Uh, hey, I really thank you for having me here. My name is Steve Street, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Green Dot, and uh, uh, we're the nation's largest issuer of prepaid MasterCard and Visa debit cards. And I've been doing it for about uh, 10 years. And a quick um, uh, background of the company, our mission, very similar really to the community bank. Uh, is we uh, have one mission, that is to provide a low cost and in many cases free FDIC insured transactional accounts to Americans who live in households making less than $75,000 a year. To give you a sense of size, there's 160 million Americans who live in households, meaning mom may be making $32,000 a year and dad making something similar, or 24, 24, or typically in our customer base, it's a single mom who's making between 30 and 40 and has uh, like two or more children. So. That gives you a sense of the flavor for the kinds of uh, uh, customers we serve. Uh, we uh, access our customer base primarily through uh, two channels, retail stores, which is what we uh, kind of invented way back. And that is if you will go into a Walmart, a Rite Aid, a Walmart, a CVS, a Radio Shack, a 7-Eleven, you'll see that green dot display at Walmart, the product's called the Walmart Money Cart. And uh, that's how we uh, acquire customers. And also online at green.com or walmart.com. And uh, uh, in terms of uh, customer base, in the last 12 months, we've issued about 6 million FDIC insured accounts to Americans through all 50 states. 
Uh, big, uh, a really big uh, hallmark of claim to fame, if you will, is that our products are known to be in alignment with all the various consumer advocacy. We want to work closely with uh, government. We want to work closely with consumer union and uh, consumer action and the NCLC and so forth and so on. Uh, our products have no overdraft fees or penalty fees of any kind ever. It's not possible to get any kind of those fees no matter what you do with the product. Um, and no minimum balance requirements. And then the product only has four fees. It's all right there in the back of the package. And you can see when you buy it off the shelf of your, of your retail. So that's kind of the, the company and, and what we do. And then uh, hopefully that's a good 30 second thumbnail background. And then I'm sorry, your question. Well, the question that I wanted to add to you is, uh, how does your product complement uh, the work or the, the, the services that maybe Broadway Federal or Cat American or even some of the big banks that are doing today? How, how, does, how does your prepaid card complement that, in your opinion? Well, complement is a tough, uh, it's a tough question. Uh, these are bank accounts. They're, uh, they're issued by banks. We partner with a couple of banks. Uh, GE is one of our issuing banks. Uh, General Electric has a large uh, thrift. And then uh, Sonova's Corporation was bank charters out of the, the south there in Georgia. And then Green Dot itself is an application to become a bank holding company. We refer to the community bank in uh, Provo, Utah. So um, uh, I guess in the sense that we're helping to pioneer this product and, and work with regulators to educate them on the product, uh, which is um, challenging. Regulators are people too. And, uh, and in the same way that these products you know, are new to many of you, they're new to them too. So they want to know what does that mean and how does it work and how does Reg E work and how does chargebacks work and how, how, how do your call centers function and how do you make money if you're not charging this for your So it's been, so I guess probably the biggest service that Green Dot has done is, is helping uh, a host uh, legions of regulators from the Federal Reserve out of, out of San Francisco and Washington, D.C. And, and the FDIC and uh, in our case also the state of Utah to become more familiar with so maybe that's how we're complement. But it's also helping consumers become more aware of what the product means. Uh, prepaid is an evolving word, you know. Uh, when when our, our company invented the product back in the late 90s, uh, uh, it was called a stored value uh, host base. It was called a host base stored value card, for those of you who remember that industry. But I didn't think that would look good on the shelf of the Walmart saying a host base stored value visa. But everyone knew what a prepaid phone card was. So we somehow just called it a prepaid visa. But I think, I think in a sense that consumers are now familiar with it, that may be helpful to uh, community banks issuing that because people know. And frankly, uh, Green Dot has a, a white label business um, uh, that we work with uh, some of the larger banks as well. And Green Bank program. That may be a way, way we can help complement also. We tell us what's happening in San Francisco. I would be happy to. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. It's nice to see so many people. I actually don't get to see often in San Francisco. So um, I'm Lee Phillips, I'm the manager of the San Francisco Office of Financial Empowerment, which is the third office of financial empowerment in the country with this one in New York City. Could you move the microphone closer? Oh, sorry, yes, thank I you. Am. I have a funny accent too, so speak <laughs> clearly. Um, and San Antonio, Texas is, also has an office of financial empowerment. And what I'd really like to talk about today is the unique role that city government can play in increasing access to and increasing financial security for underserved um, people in our community. Our office, our office is uh, based in the San Francisco Treasurer's Office, and our elected treasurer, Jose Cisneros, and many, and many of you might know him, uh, he took office in 2004, and since then has embarked upon what we call, or like to think of, as a very innovative financial empowerment agenda. Um, our office is the banker and the chief investment officer and, of course, the tax collector. If you want to talk about people and hires, have a <laughs> tax collector on your, on your business card. Um, for the city and county of San Francisco. And that actually puts us at a very unique vantage point to uh, engage in these types of initiatives. And that's what we've been looking at over the last six years, is how can we use our, our expertise and our position within the local government to um, further these financial and housing goals. We have a very unique position because we touch pretty much everybody in the community. If you're a business, you're registering with our office. If you're a banker, you're doing business with our office. And if you're paying taxes to our office, et cetera, et cetera. And I don't think you can find um, beyond the local government another group that plays that same role within the community. We're an influencer, we're a convener, we're a funder, uh, we're policy makers, 
work with community-based organizations, you know, across the across the realm, we're pretty much touching everything that goes on in San Francisco. And the other thing that's unique to us is that we have very deep ties with the community. Um, regardless of what you might think about elected officials, um, a message that comes from the government does actually have a different weight to it, I think, than a message that comes from another group, even the largest nonprofit group. So what we've been really trying to do in San Francisco is look at how can we get these messages like get a bank account, or a prepaid card, that's actually one of our new messages we'll talk about. Um, don't get ripped off for payday lenders, keep your money safe, take financial education. How can we incorporate those messages the same way that we tell people to get a smoke alarm, or get your kids vaccinated, or you know, lock your door at night? The public is very used to hearing public health and safety messages from their uh, local authority, and we're really trying to extend that role as well. So just to talk briefly about some of the work that we've actually been doing um, over the last six years in San Francisco, one of the first things we did on the policy side was to use our zoning regulations to limit the spread of check cashers and payday lenders. So we passed a moratorium on any new check casher and payday lender opening up within a quarter mile of an existing check casher or payday lender. So unless you want to go and uh, open up a payday lender in Pacific Heights, you're probably not going to be able to open a business of that type uh, in San Francisco. And that was what we, we worked on with our board of supervisors and the mayor to um, kind of stop the um, influence and spread of these uh, types of businesses in our low income and uh, communities. From that, we then had a tax credit program, the Working Families Credit, and we found out some of the numbers that Olivia mentioned earlier about how much money is left on the table by people not claiming their own income tax credit. We decided to both offer a local match. Initially, it was 10% of your EITC. Now it's a, it was a $100 flat rate, but we changed that recently too. So in the first year of that program, we had 10,000 people applying for Working Families Credit. Um, initially, you only got that credit through a uh, paper check. And the last year, we actually restructured it so if you use direct deposit, you get more money. If you use a paper check, you get less money. We saw our direct deposit rates go from uh, below 10% to about 80% in one year. From the Working Families Credit Program, we learned that a large number of our, um, of our check recipients were taking those checks to a check voucher. So now, not only were they using their own money, now it was our money that was going into these types of businesses. And that was something that was very concerning to us. And Olivia, of course, at New America is too humble because she did not mention that the original idea of the bank loan came from our colleague Anne Stilgar at the New America Foundation. And I think I'll just talk a little bit about the bank loan program because that's what kind of emerged um, from this tax credit experience. Because I do think it's a, a really great moment of how a public private partnership can work from this effectively. So a think tank brings an idea to city government and says, we think we can use your influence to work with banks and credit unions to offer better products and services for underserved communities here in San Francisco. We look at the numbers and um, we're equally shocked by what's going on with people who don't have access to mainstream banking and we decide to do something about it. We come up with a plan and then of course the mayor issues an invitation to all of the banks and credit unions in San Francisco. And if the mayor invites people to a meeting, they can much shut up. So that's great. We held that meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. Again, another key then lend their credibility um, to this effort. You know, I think down in LA you might have less of a crazy reputation than we do up in San Francisco, but sometimes not everyone thinks that the um, policies of the local government in San Francisco are you know, the same. Um, but this one, everyone seemed to agree was. But um, having the regulatory agency at the table really helps lend credibility with this awesome wacky lefty San Francisco program that this was a real thing, you know, that we could do, and it was legal. Um, which is more important. So we held that meeting at the Federal Reserve Bank back in um, 2005. And from there, we used our influence with banks and credit unions to um, basically say, if you develop a product with us that um, is going to remove barriers to banking, we will then use our public voice to go and tell everyone to do business with your institution. That's exactly what we did. Um, San Francisco Treasurer's Office invests about $3 billion in assets in any given day. We also manage all of the banking with the largest employer in the city of San Francisco. So our influence is pretty extensive in terms of, um, of influencing bank and credit partners. Although it is important to know that bank loan is an entirely voluntary program. There's no ties to, um, you don't get more deposits if you are a member of the program, it's going to be voluntary. So we developed the bank loan product, and then we um, went out and worked with our community-based organizations to spread the word, um, and so increased our, our trust factor by using the and as Olivia mentioned, we have um, banks now somewhere in the region of 70,000 accounts for them. Um, again, to continue 
that story and look at um, how local government can play it and have an impact on scale. Uh, probably about a year after we launched Bank on, we got a phone call from the city of Seattle. Can you come up here and show us how you did that program? The next call came from uh, Evansville, Indiana. Can you come to Evansville? I traveled a lot. I made my United uh, Premier Stats and Stats. Um, the state of California, governor's office, actually LA was a little bit before them. And so now we've seen this program spread to 70 cities and states, and I think largely because of that infrastructure, we all have local government, we all have banks and credit unions, we all have community-based organizations, we all have unbanked populations, and um, if we're lucky, if we don't have the involvement of the federal regulatory agencies, in this case, um, in our case, the Federal Reserve Bank, but also the FGSC is taking a leadership role here as well. From BankCon, our credit unions came to us and said, well, we think we can do something even more innovative than can we have a subcommittee? So we have a subcommittee on that credit unions who then created an alternative payday loan. So we have five credit unions in San Francisco that you can now borrow up to $500. Um, the maximum APR is 